Jerry, we'll go to you. Yeah, Jay, I wonder how, uh, how many things you guys have tried to get the last four minutes going and <laughs> what, what options are left? Uh, well, you keep trying. We've tried a lot uh, and we'll keep chipping away. You know, I think a big part of it, this game was just, we, we fouled a lot against Mizzou. And that was a big, big, big reason why we lost that last four uh, up there. Um, but you know, you just keep, keep chipping away. We're close. You know, you keep saying you're close, but it's just little things that keep happening like that. Like you can't have four fouls and five fouls when they're in the bonus in the last five minutes and then three turnovers. You know, that's the, no matter who you are, that's going to come back and bite you. So it's just something you just, we keep working on and we keep attacking it. And uh, Coach Cal has mentioned that you guys, it would be better if you had a go-to guy, somebody that, uh, you know, a star, for lack of a better word. How, how much of an... Uh, a hindrance is that for any team not to have that go-to guy? Well, you know, it's something that is always, it's a security blanket. You know, when you can go to somebody and you can throw them the ball or kind of spread the floor and let them drive, create, get fouled, especially like you were saying, the last four minutes of the game, that's really when it's the biggest. Um, so, you know, ours right now is, is it's a game by game thing. You know, it may be Olivier one game when he's got it going. It may be Davion. Uh, when he's making jump shots or, you know, in a few games, maybe Keon. So it's just, it's, it's kind of a field thing. You know, I think that's kind of what Coach Kyle was saying. We just don't have that one definite that we know we can go to. But, you know, depending on how that game's going, yeah, that person could be anybody. Ken Spencer, you're next, and then John Hill after him. Jay, you know, these last four minutes, these, you know, handful of games, it just doesn't seem like anything goes right for you guys during that stretch. Is it as simple as maybe making a bucket or two and just kind of getting that confidence going the other way? It's that simple. You know, I wish I had a more educated answer for you, but it is that simple, you know, or it's as simple as what Mizzou did and just being able to get fouled and make free throws. You know, it just changes the pressure. It changes the momentum of the game. Um, and, you know, you have to have a little bit of luck. Some of those shots that you get at the end of the shot clock that is a somewhat clean look, you know, you just need one of those to go in. And I think that's just been a big, a big thing the whole year. And, you know, watching other games is something you see, especially, you know, with younger teams that is just a, it's, it's a problem on both ends. John Hale, go ahead. Jay, what exactly makes Coach Barnes such a successful coach at his programs everywhere he's been? And, and then just what are your emotions going against him this week, given your relationship? Uh, you know, he's one of – he, like you said, he's one of the very best coaches. And I think the one thing about him, uh, and it's something that's very similar with Coach Cal, is that they all hold you to a high level of accountability uh, within the program, on the court and what you're doing. And I think that's the first thing, especially when dealing with young kids who are 18 to 22, you have to have a certain level and hold them to a level of accountability. And I think they both do a good job. And I think, you know, with Coach Barnes, it just goes to show how good a coach he is, just the programs at Clemson, Texas, um, at Tennessee, what he's doing now, you know, it just goes to show that the proof is in the pudding. And I'm excited to see him. He's one of the few people I still, talk to you know I talked to him last when everything came out with him and the COVID stuff and he's actually a person I called when I was asking about making this transition so you know he's somebody who's close to me and gave me my start in coaching. Jerry Tipton coming back to you. Jay that, uh, I was just listening there and it it sounds like you sought out his opinion about uh moving to Kentucky is that correct and uh if so uh what did he say to you? Yeah, I did. And uh, he kind of just told me, you know, so it's, it's a once in a life opportunity. And I already knew that. And uh, that was something he expressed to me. And he talked really high of Coach Cal and the city of Lexington, you know, and he's somebody whose opinion I hold very, very close to my heart. So I know he wouldn't lead me in the wrong direction or anything like that. So, you know, he was very, very, very spoke very highly of everything. And I also wanted to ask you, Coach Cal on his radio show talked about, uh, you know, maybe you, you guys could put more shooters in the game to improve the offense, but it might take away from the defense. So there's a balancing thing there. How delicate is that? How does a coach, you know, just generically try to weigh that, something like that? 
is I mean, <laughs> it's very delicate because you know um you can have shooting in the game and if they're not making shots then they're not helping you on one end and not helping you on the other end as well so you know it's kind of it's, 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 it's a dance you have to kind of have to kind of balance it out and um you know like I was saying earlier especially with us it's just game by game you know sometimes you know you have to be able to give a little to get a little you know what I mean so if you're exchanging threes for twos you may be fine for a little moment of the game and then when the game get tight and get closer and it becomes more of a defensive struggle it's harder to you know kind of leave the shooting out there if you can't do substitutions for offense defense stuff like that so it's just kind of a tricky tricky spot it puts you in John Wall we're coming to you and then John Clay Hey, Jay, as far as the struggles for the last four minutes of the game, it seems like that there's never really any consistency in terms of the lineup of the guys who are finishing the games. I know foul trouble enters into that, but uh, is that decision just based on, on the head coach's gut feeling or are there some numbers or analytics that determine who's going to be effective during that time of the game? I mean, we, we are doing everything. You know, it's a coaching staff's suggestion. Um, it's analytics. It's everything. Um, it's a feel with how the game's going. Um, it's kind of like we talked about earlier. Uh, like all the questions been asked, sometimes not having a per se go-to player that comes into effect and the shooting comes into effect and the offense defense. So, you know, with us, we're just trying anything and trying to find whatever's working. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, with it being how our team is structured, how the year is going like that, it's really a game by game. And it's kind of a field thing because we're just trying to find whatever will work at that time. During the heat of battle, is, is Coach Cal actually uh, asking for your opinion? Are you guys proactively giving input or, or how does that work? It's both. You know, it's both. He's asking for our opinion and we'll give him you know, our suggestions as well. You know, ultimately he's the head coach, he's gonna make the decision, but he does do a good job of at least including us and asking us what we think and uh, what we think we should do, who should be in, match up, stuff like that. So I will say it's a collective thing. John Clay, go ahead. Jay, as somebody who played the position, what are you seeing from Devin Askew and his development? He's a freshman. I mean, that's the the best way to put it, you know, and that's what he looks like. You know, he's got a million things coming at him um, and he's just trying to figure it out. And, you know, they, he's he's just getting thrown into the fire. You know, there's not really, we don't, with Terrence being out, you know, we don't have another per se point guard uh, that you can throw out there and play. We have Davion who is doing a little bit. We even, Devin got hurt in practice before the Missouri game, we didn't even think he was going to play. So then we had BJ out there trying to play point guard for a little bit. So, you know, he's just getting the short end of the stick of just having to, you know, really just learn through mistakes and everything. And it is, so, you know, sometimes it doesn't look great, but he's doing a great job of at least keeping his head up, attacking and trying to do what we're asking. In a quick follow, if, if you know, to get through this with the struggles, how can that help him in the future? Uh, because it will build, you know, it's just like he has to get battle scars. So, you know, he's not one of those kids. He's very strong willed, very strong minded. He's not one of those kids who's going to crumble, you know, under it. At least I don't think being around him. Um, he's not one of those guys. And, you know, this is just going to build his confidence. You know, you can't really. You know, especially for Devin, especially playing a point guard position, which is, I think, and I might be biased, the hardest position on the court, um, you know, for him is just he's going to have to know that he's seen the depths, he's seen the darks and knowing, like, I can't do this. I learned that this doesn't work. I have to adjust. I have to change my game. And that's where he is right now. He's having to change his game. I'm talking about a kid who came to college a year early too. Uh, to throw that on top of it. And then the COVID year where he didn't get a summer, he didn't get a preseason. And the biggest thing for freshmen are those those early buy games to build their confidence and stuff. So, you know, he's just getting the short end of the stick all the way around. But I think he will be better by it. Lonnie, we'll go to you, and then Jerry will circle back. Jay, uh, uh, through the COVID issues and, and some early uh, in, injury situations and what have you, I know that uh, those things are kind of, uh, you know, kind of may, maybe – derailed you to some degree, but overall looking, you know, kind of looking through all of that, weeding through all of that, 
are you how surprised are you that things have, have haven't gone maybe like you might have thought they were gone uh, at the beginning um well i guess i'm a little surprised just because i didn't know what to expect you didn't know what to expect so you know you're thinking that you have this four weeks six weeks because it's something that's never been you know, it's something I've never experienced or gone through, not having summer and buy games and stuff like that. So you kind of figure, you know, things would kind of work naturally. And then as the games come and as they're played, you understand that, ah, I understand this is some of the stuff you need to have successful teams. And especially when you're young and have 10 new guys, it's certain things that have to happen. If you look at a lot of the rankings and those top five, top 10 teams like Baylor, Gonzaga, I mean, those are old teams, even Texas, who I had before, those are old teams. So it benefits them because they've been in the program for three and four years. This stuff that they understand and been through, they don't have to experience. Now, when you get 10 new guys at a new place with new coach, they're experiencing things in the season that should have been done in September. So I think that's what I didn't account for is that kind of gap, that kind of mesh, you know, and I think that's why your best teams in college basketball are older this year. And it's not as much, they might not be the most talented team, but they are the best team because they have some type of continuity. Jerry, back to you. Jay, yeah, you mentioned uh, you guys taking a look at BJ at point guard. How did he look? <laughs> well, you know, it was a spur of the moment type thing. So it wasn't something, you know, that he was expecting. Nobody's expected it. So it just kind of happened. Uh, and, you know, you're always excited as a player when you get to have the ball in your hands more. So I think that was his first initial thought. And then some of the pressures were coming and having to make the right plays and do things like that. Then you're like, okay, I understand. I'll go back over here on the wing. So it was kind of like that. But, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, you just had to, we had to be ready for. And a Tennessee's defense is highly rated. What makes it effective? What, are the, what do they bring? What's the challenge there? Uh, one thing is like all Coach Barnes team, they play extremely hard and uh, they really focus on defense. And then they have probably one of the best defenders in the country in the big kid Ponds. Um, he does a good job and they have, you know, big size with their guards and athleticism. And, uh, you know, you can just tell that they is something they take pride in. And I think that's the one thing you got to kind of figure out how you can attack them and what you can to do to kind of expose some of this stuff, but it's not easy. They do it they're really good defensively. And I think that early on, that was their calling card, you know, kind of started to try to figure that out again. 